thanks very much for the opportunity to come and give this talk um, and to the conference organizers for a fantastic conference. Um, as you just heard, my name is Robin Thompson. I'm an associate professor in Warwick, uh, but from September this year, I'll be moving as an associate professor to the Mathematical Institute in Oxford. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that. And I'm really sorry that I can't be there with you uh, today. Um, but nonetheless, I hope you enjoy the talk, which is all about the inference of pathogen transmissibility during infectious disease outbreaks. So my research group in Warwick um, is interested in infectious disease outbreak modeling, and in particular is interested in the development of novel mathematical methods to answer questions that are important for public health throughout infectious disease outbreaks. So early on in an outbreak, we're interested in questions like our initial cases of disease, the kind of first cases arri arriving in a population, are they gonna lead on to a major epidemic with large numbers of cases? Or are they going to fade out as a minor outbreak so you only end up having a very small number of cases and then related to that we're interested in which interventions can we put in place in order to reduce the risk of getting a large epidemic then in the middle of an outbreak our attention shifts and it turns to questions like how effective are current public health measures and then which interventions can be brought in in order to sort of optimize or minimize uh, quantities that are important for public health so that might be the numbers of cases that we're expecting to see going forwards. It might be uh, numbers of hospitalizations or it might be numbers of deaths. And then again, towards the end of an epidemic, um, again, the, our attention shifts and it comes on to questions like how can interventions be removed safely without there being a substantial risk of a sort of flare up and lots of cases going forwards. And if you haven't seen cases for the last couple of weeks, let's say, we're interested in questions like, is the epidemic over? So has it finished or might we see more cases in future? So clearly um, at all these different stages of an outbreak, bioinference is likely to be very important. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in the first part of this talk. And then in the second part of this talk, I'm gonna go on and uh, talk specifically about one area of an epidemic, specifically the middle phase of an epidemic when you've got large numbers of cases. And I'll talk about how changes in pathogen transmissibility uh, can be tracked using an inference method. So specifically, I'll talk about estimation of the time-dependent reproduction number, or RT. I'll talk about how you can extend the basic model that I'll present. And then I'll talk about some of our recent work in this area and some areas uh, that could be interesting areas to work on going forwards. So as I say, so early in an outbreak, we're interested in questions like, are initial cases of disease arriving in a new host population going to lead on to a major epidemic with large numbers of cases? And there are a few ways you can look at addressing that question. The simplest way to address that question is just to run large numbers of simulations of a stochastic epidemiological model. So for example, you might start with just a single case and you might run lots of simulations. And then some of your simulations of your stochastic model might look like the blue and the black lines in this figure here. And some of the simulations of your stochastic model might look like the red line in this figure here. And then one way to estimate the probability of a major epidemic is to say, well, that's just the proportion of simulations that look like the blue and the black line, as opposed to that look like the red line. And if you have a stochastic compartmental model, it's also possible to, to derive an expression for the probability of a major epidemic. And in particular, if you have a model like an SIR model, a stochastic SIR model, you can write down an expression for the probability of a major epidemic analytically. And indeed, it looks like this on the right-hand side. So one minus one over the basic reproduction number of the pathogen raised to the power of the number of infected individuals you start with. But the key point here is that if you want to estimate the probability of a major epidemic, then something you need to know is you need to know the basic reproduction number, which characterizes pathogen transmissibility. And of course, in order to know the basic reproduction number, inference is the key thing. You need to take data from an ongoing outbreak and, and sort of estimate pathogen transmissibility. That's the key thing you need to do in order to know how likely it is that early cases of disease are going to lead on to a big epidemic. So that's the beginning of an outbreak. Then in the middle of an outbreak, um, like I said before, we're interested in questions like how effective are current control measures. One way to assess this, which I'll come back to later, is tracking the time dependent reproduction number. So this is just a number that essentially tells you how transmissible your pathogen is and it changes in response to public health measures. And I'll come back to that a little bit later on in the talk. Something else I wanted to, uh, to sort of highlight just because I think it's perhaps an interesting example of where inference has great potential in mathematical epidemiology is this example here. 
And in particular, I'll draw your attention to the inset. So in this inset, what we've got is we've got posterior estimates of the basic reproduction number of a pathogen. So again, that's just a, a kind of number characterizing pathogen transmissibility. And each line in this inset represents different times during an outbreak. So as you can see early on, if you have an entirely novel pathogen, you have no idea about how the pathogen is spreading, right? You've got this blue posterior that is very wide. But then as the outbreak goes on and you collect more and more data from your, from your outbreak, then your estimate of how the pathogen is spreading becomes more and more precise, such that even by the time you get to about 20 days into an outbreak, you have a much better idea of how the pathogen is being transmitted. And when you get to 50 days, you've got a very good idea of the basic reproduction number of the pathogen. And I think this leads on to a, a sort of interesting idea, which is um, which comes originally from the ecological modeling literature as this idea of learning before, before you leap. So the idea here is that if you want to find an invasive pest, then a good strategy might not, in fact, be to set your kind of final control strategy straight away or your final searching strategy straight away. But instead, you might want to observe the pest spreading, perhaps in another location, essentially allow the pest to spread before deciding what your searching strategy should be. So you, there's this sort of learning phase in which you allow the uncertainty and how the pest is spreading to be resolved. And then you set your final strategy and that sort of allows your searching strategy to be optimized. And the analogous thing in sort of outbreak management is that you might want to allow your pathogen to spread for a while before deciding what your final control strategy is going to be. Because by having this sort of observation phase at the beginning, you allow uncertainty in how the pathogen is spreading to be resolved. You sort of learn how the pathogen is spreading and therefore how it might be optimal to control the pathogen. Of course, there are sort of ethical uh, ethical things to think about there too, right? You know, is it okay to allow the pathogen to spread for a few days before deciding what your control strategy should be? That's, I think, an open question. But nonetheless, it shows that inference can be really important in terms of finding the optimal control strategy when faced with an invading pathogen. Okay, and then at the end of an infectious disease outbreak, um, we're interested in questions like how can interventions be lifted and is the outbreak over? And this figure in the bottom right is some work that we did on Ebola virus disease. And specifically what this graph shows is it shows the probability that an Ebola virus disease outbreak is over as a function of how long it's been since you last saw a case. So specifically, of course, if you wait for 100 days and you haven't seen a case for the last 100 days, then that means you can be pretty certain that the outbreak is over and that there aren't going to be any more Ebola cases. If you wait for a very short time period, then you can be um, a lot less certain that your Ebola outbreak is over. And this is important because this can feed into uh, public health decisions about when to declare Ebola outbreaks over. The key thing, again, is that in order to see you know, this graph here, it depends absolutely critically on characteristics of transmis transmission of the pathogen. So again, pathogen transmissibility, how the pathogen is spreading. Um, and so in order to be able to estimate the sort of confidence that an Ebola outbreak is over, again, inference is exceptionally important. You need to be able to infer the, path uh, the parameters of your epidemiological model that govern transmission. So hopefully that's uh, reasonably convincing. Perhaps I didn't need to convince anyone here about this, but hopefully that's reasonably convincing that bioinference and, and inference is absolutely essential in mathematical epidemiology and in sort of infectious disease outbreak management. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to turn on uh, the, to the second part of the talk, and in particular, I'm going to focus on the question of how transmissible is a pathogen. So the setting that we've got is we've got data from an ongoing outbreak, and we want to say, essentially, how transmissible the pathogen is. How is the pathogen spreading? Specifically, what we're going to do is we're going to look to estimate the time varying reproduction number, which I will define kind of formally in a moment. But I think the key thing to mention here is that we developed a method for estimating the time varying reproduction number, but in this work that we did, uh, which was before the COVID-19 pandemic, we not only developed an inference procedure, but we also developed a software application that we hosted online. And I think this was quite important and was an absolutely key reason why this work ended up getting used quite a lot during the COVID-19 pandemic, because we had this software out where users can come along with their own outbreak data, upload their own outbreak data. The app would then sort of implement the inference procedure, and then the user would be able to sort of obtain estimates of the time varying reproduction number throughout an outbreak using their own data. 
So I think this really emphasizes the sort of importance of the development, not only of inference methods, but also of associated software that implement those inference methods. So in order to understand this work, we need to know about two things. So the first thing is the time dependent reproduction number. That's the thing that we're trying to estimate. And the time dependent reproduction number is the number of cases of disease generated by someone who's infected at time T. So in other words, if I'm infected at time T, then the time dependent reproduction number is the number of people that I'm expected to go on and infect. And there's this sort of threshold behavior in the time dependent reproduction number or RT as it's called. There's this threshold behavior such that if RT is bigger than one, then that means that every infected individual is expected to go on and infect more than one other individual on average. And so what you'd expect is you'd expect your outbreak to grow. You'd expect transmission to, to happen throughout your, you know, it, the pathogen is going to spread throughout the population and your outbreak is going to get bigger and bigger. On the other hand, if the time dependent reproduction number is less than one, that means that on average, each infected person will infect fewer than one other person. And so you would expect your outbreak to be in decline, right? There isn't enough transmission for the outbreak to be growing. So you have this threshold behavior and the value of RT equals one is a kind of crucial threshold. The other thing that we need to know about in order to understand this work is the serial interval. And the serial interval is a probability distribution that characterizes the time between successive cases in a chain of transmission. So what we mean there is, and, and to be absolutely precise about it, the serial interval is the, the time between successive symptom onset times in a chain of transmission. So that means that if I infect you, then the serial interval is the time period between me showing symptoms and then you showing symptoms. And we can think of this kind of informally as if we have a data set with the number of cases every day, a serial interval is essentially the time period in between those cases. So as I was saying a moment ago, if I infect you, then what this particular distribution is saying is that the, the probability that you show symptoms or that you're a case the day after me is about 0.22. The probability that you show symptoms two days after me, if I infect you is about 0.35. The probability that you show symptoms three days after me is about 0.2 and so on and so on. So essentially, it's just a probability distribution characterizing the time between successive cases in a chain of transmission. So in order to run a kind of very basic epidemiological model, that's all you really need. You just need to know the time dependent reproduction number and you need to know the serial interval distribution. And if you have these two things, you can run a simulation of an epidemic. So what, um, how you might do that is you might say, well, suppose that what we've run in our simulation up till now are the sort of black, uh, black bars. So these are the numbers of cases each day in the outbreak so far. And what we want to do is we want to simulate the number of cases that occur today on day T. Well, the way that we do this, if we know the time dependent reproduction number and we know the serial interval distribution is we say, well, let's consider how many cases there were the previous day. Each one of those cases on the previous day will generate RT cases each. And the proportion of those RT cases each that are going to occur in the data set on day T is simply equal to the probability that the serial interval is one day. In other words, W1. The number of cases on day T that arise from cases the day before is simply equal to RT times by the number of cases the day before times by W1. And then you can say, well, how many cases will arise on day T from individuals that were cases two days ago and well, cases two days ago will also infect RT individuals each. The probability that those infections arise on day T is then W2. And so the number of cases on day T arising from infectors on day T minus two is just the number of cases on day T minus two times by RT times by W2. And so on and so on and so on. So you can just basically work your way back through all the cases you've seen previously, each time doing the reproduction number times by the number of cases on that day times by the relevant contribution from the serial interval, add those up. And then what you've got is you've got the number of cases that you expect to see on day T. And then of course, the number of cases that actually occur on day T is not likely to be exactly the expected number of cases on day T, but there's gonna be some sort of stochasticity. So we can put some distribution on the number of cases we expect to see on day T. Um, so here, for example, in the bottom right, we've got a Poisson distributed number of cases on day T. Um, with mean equal to the expected number of cases on day T, which can be calculated as I just described. And so then you've got a very basic simulation model where each day going forwards, you can just sample from this probability distribution for the number of cases you see each day. 
Okay, so that's how you can run a simulation of an epidemic in the, probably the simplest possible way. Um, of course, we're interested in doing inference and we want to work out a probability density function a posterior for the time dependent reproduction number or RT. And we've got an expression written down for the probability of getting X cases on day T given RT. And then of course we can just use Bayes rule um, to write down the probability or the probability density for RT given the number of cases that we actually see on day T. And so that's one way to construct an estimate for the time dependent reproduction number. This is all fine and it does obtain an estimate of the time dependent reproduction number each day, but there is a slight problem in doing this. And the slight problem in doing this is that it generates estimates of RT that fluctuate quite a lot, right? They're very sensitive to randomness in the time dependent reproduction, uh, sorry, in the number of cases you see each day. So to put that another way, if you imagine that we're in a setting in which the time dependent reproduction number is actually one, what that means is that we're expecting a roughly constant number of cases each day. So we might be expecting, for example, 100 cases every day. So you've got 100 cases on the first day, 100 cases on the second day, and so on and so on. In practice, though, because of randomness between contacts um, and randomness in pathogen transmission, you know, it doesn't transmit every time you have a contact, you won't actually see 100 cases every day, even if the time-dependent reproduction number is one. What you would see instead is you might see you know, 110 cases on the first day and then 90 cases on the second day, maybe 100 cases on the third day and 96 cases on the fourth day and so on. There'll be some randomness in exactly how many cases you see every day. And that randomness will be reflected in your estimates of the time varying reproduction number. So your time varying reproduction number estimates would also fluctuate every day. And so the solution to this, because we don't really want those fluctuations to be there because those fluctuations aren't sort of representative of changes in the time dependent reproduction number they just reflect randomness in transmission which we don't really want to consider what we do instead is we consider that the time dependent production number rt is constant over some time window so specifically we assume that it's constant for a window of tau plus one days between t minus tau and t and then we repeat exactly the same inference procedure that i just described so in other words, you can write down an expression for the probability of getting X T minus tau cases on day T minus tau and X T minus tau plus one cases on day T minus tau plus one and so on and so on up to X T cases on day T. Then we can use Bayes rule to write down a, uh, exactly as before a probability de density function for RT, but now not just based on the number of cases that we saw on day T, but instead based on the number of cases that we saw on each of the days from T minus tau up to T. So it's exactly the same idea as before, but we're just considering a constant value of the time dependent reproduction number over a window from T minus tau up to T. So then we've got a kind of very basic framework for estimating the time dependent reproduction number. And what the framework does is it allows us to feed in a data set of the number of cases we see every day during an infectious disease outbreak. It allows us to feed in an estimate, so a distributional estimate of the serial interval. And then we have to make a choice as to this window length tau, so the, the window length over which we assume the time dependent reproduction number is constant. And if we've got all of those things, we feed them in, and then the output we get looks a bit like this, where we can track changes in pathogen transmission during an outbreak. And so specifically, the estimate for the time dependent reproduction number on this day here depends on the number of cases uh, on that day, but also on the tau days previously. The estimate for the time dependent reproduction number on this day here depends on the number of cases on that day, but also the tau days previously, and so on and so on and so on. Okay, we then took this kind of basic modeling framework and we looked to extend it in a few different ways. So that this was in the work that we published in 2019. And one of the ways that we looked to extend this is we looked to allow within the inference framework, we looked to allow uh, the possibility that the serial interval can also be estimated directly from primary data. The reason that this was important is that previously what tended to happen is that you'd have one group of researchers that would take some data and estimate the serial interval, and then they would go about publishing it, and maybe it would take a year to do that. And then after that, you'd have this sort of publicly available serial interval distribution, and then that serial interval distribution would be taken by another research group who would then use that serial interval distribution to estimate the time varying reproduction number. But by the time you've done all that, you're at least a year, uh, you know, your serial interval estimate is at least a year out of date. Um, and the serial interval is something that can change 
within an outbreak and certainly between outbreaks, even of the same pathogen. Um, and so what that meant is that there was bias in the reproduction number estimates because the serial interval distribution that was typically being used in these types of analyses weren't necessarily the kind of current serial interval distribution. And so, like I say, within this inference framework, we include the possibility that the serial interval can itself be estimated. And then the second thing we did is, is shown down in the bottom left, and that is that we allow um, in cases that have come in from elsewhere to be differentiated from cases that contracted the pathogen locally. And the reason that this is important is that if you don't do that and you assume that all the cases in your data set contracted the pathogen within your host population, then you overestimate the number of infectees in your population. And if you overestimate the number of infectees in your population, so there are too many infections happening locally, then of course you overestimate the time dependent reproduction number because you think that too many infections are, are sort of happening locally. And so we included this possibility dif to differentiate between these two different types of case. This is an example that shows that that can be important. So this specific example is uh, for MERS, a coronavirus, um, and specifically this data is data from Saudi Arabia. And I think one of the interesting things here is that imported cases are not what you might think of usually uh, for imported cases. So these are not individuals that have come in to the population from a geographically distinct location, but imported cases here are instead cases that have come in sort of directly from an animal reservoir. So specifically MERS survives in, it's a zoonotic disease, it survives in animals, in this case, in dromedary camels. It gets transmitted into humans, but then there's also there's also then some human to human transmission. But what that means is that you've then got a combination of cases. You've got people that have been infected directly from the animal reservoir, but then you've also got people that have been infected through human to human transmission. And if you assume that all of the cases arose from local cases, then the output that you get when you estimate the time varying reproduction number in this particular data set is the black line here. But if you properly account for the fact that some of your cases have instead been infected from the animal reservoir, then what you get instead is you get the red line in the bottom. So the red line is a kind of more accurate reproduction number estimate. And I think most important are the regions that I've highlighted in blue here. And the regions that are highlighted in blue are regions where if you don't separate local and imported cases, you think that the time varying reproduction number is bigger than one, or the median estimate at least. Whereas if you do properly separate out imported and local cases, then you find that the time varying reproduction number is in fact less than one in the blue regions. So in other words, in the blue regions, if you don't properly separate imported and local cases, you think that essentially the outbreak is not under control in the human population when in fact it is, in fact, the reproduction number is less than one. So that's all for... Um, for that kind of part of the talk. So just to conclude that part of the talk, well, parameter inference is really important for estimating reproduction numbers in real time during epidemics. I should say that the kind of, if, despite its simplicity, the very simple approach that I've just shown was the basis for a huge amount of research um, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Lots of research groups took that method and extended it in a range of different ways. I think something else to take away from it, though, is that population heterogeneity is exceptionally important. So, for example, considering local cases and, and noting that they may be different in terms of their kind of characteristics of infection compared to imported cases is something that is essential to bear in mind because that can affect your estimates of reproduction numbers. So I'll just very briefly then talk a little bit about some sort of recent developments um, in this type of work that my group have done. And I think this can be the basis of further research going forwards. So in all of the work that I've described so far, the assumption was that you had an estimate of the serial interval that you could feed in in order to estimate the time dependent reproduction number, or you had data with which you could estimate the serial interval. A related quantity to the serial interval is the generation time. So for the purposes of this talk, I think it's probably worth thinking of the generation time as very similar to the serial interval. It's just a, a, a time period that characterizes the time between successive cases. And my PhD student, now postdoc, Will Hart, has done some great work um, during the COVID-19 pandemic looking at estimating the generation times, so the time between cases, in other words, the speed of transmission um, of SARS-CoV-2. And so specifically in this left graph, what he did was um, he looked at how the generation time, the time between cases, changed throughout 2020. 
And what you can see in this graph, so this is from data from the UK, so from data in UK households, what you can see is that there was a shortening in the time between transmissions as you go from the kind of earliest part of the, of the epidemic in the UK to kind of later in 2020. And there are a couple of possible reasons for this, but our main hypothesis here is that if you remember the kind of very start of the, of the epidemic in the UK, so soon after lockdown was introduced in March 2020, that was a very kind of warm period, a sort of uncharacteristically warm period for March in the UK. So what I meant was that individuals were spending a lot of time outside. Whereas if you compare that to later in the year, by the time we got to September and November, it was uh, much more kind of characteristically cool in the UK. And so the result of that was that people were spending a lot more time inside. So our hypothesis there was that that meant that people were spreading the virus more quickly because they were spending more time inside and therefore having kind of closer contacts. Um, and so that might be the reason for this sort of reduction in the generation time between early 2020 and late 2020. The other thing that Will did is he looked at changes in the generation time between uh, different variants of SARS-CoV-2 as the outbreak went on. And what you can see is you can see that the Delta variant ended up having a shorter generation time compared to the Alpha variant. So in other words, the, the variant driving transmission can be an important thing to consider when you're setting your serial interval or generation time and estimating the time-dependent reproduction number. I think the very last thing I'm going to talk about is another recent development, um, which is some work that uh, we did with um, some of the organisers of this conference. And so this looked in more detail at this idea that local cases and imported cases can have different transmission characteristics. In the work that I described earlier, we made the assumption that the sort of onwards transmission risk from a local case is the same as the onwards transmission risk from an imported case. And this may not be true for a number of reasons. So it could be that imported cases, uh, you know, largely business travellers, for example, who are likely to have large numbers of meetings and therefore generate larger numbers of cases than your typical person. It could also be the case, though, that an imported case, you know, imported cases are subject to sort of quarantine restrictions. And so almost transmission risk might be smaller for an imported case compared to a local case. So in either case, the idea here is that local cases and imported cases may represent different transmission risks. And that's something that we explored in, um, in this research article in the bottom right. So I'm going to leave it there. I'm just going to stop by uh, finally saying that I hopefully I've managed to convince you that inference is an absolutely essential part of infectious disease outbreak modeling. When an outbreak's ongoing, epidemiological models and Bayesian inference can be used together in order to estimate pathogen transmissibility, specifically the time varying reproduction number. This is useful for inferring whether or not an outbreak is under control. There's this threshold such that if the reproduction number is less than one, then that means the outbreak's under control. And if it's greater than one, that means the outbreak is not. And then finally, you can extend estimates of the time varying reproduction number to include differences between individuals and to include things like temporal changes in the serial interval or generation time. So I'll stop there. And thanks again uh, to the organizers for the chance to give this talk. Thanks. Thanks, Robin, for your nice talk. Um, what are the estimation methods you used for inference? Like in general, like is one method or do you different methods? Yeah. Yeah, so um, yeah, so that's a great question. I guess typically the approaches used um, by my group. So I mean, I guess you've got relatively simple approaches of the type that I showed in this talk where you can essentially analytically derive a, a posterior. Um, more complex stuff that we do typically involves um, MCMC quite a lot of the time. So as an example, this uh, this figure here, so all of these um, estimates of the generation time involve data augmentation, MCMC. Um, the reason that you need to, maybe I'll come back to that in a second actually, but the uh, in more complex settings where you can just simulate models, um, but you can't write down the likelihood, then we end up using ABC um, quite a lot, although we try and use MCMC and other, other methods where we can. Um, just to say something more specific about this figure here. So one of the things that makes this hard, so I talked about the, the serial interval earlier in the talks. The serial interval is the time between successive symptom onset times. And that's something that you can typically observe because people report when they develop symptoms. And so that's something that it's relatively straightforward to estimate so long as people report accurately when they develop symptoms. The generation time is a related quantity, but it's actually the time between successive infections in a chain of transmission. And infections are something, of course, that aren't observed. So if I infect you and then you show symptoms five days later, um, we don't know exactly when that infection 
took place. And so that's why in a case like this, you need to use data augmentation, MCMC, um, or yeah, methods like reversible jump MCMC um, to account for the fact that you don't sort of see all the data. So yeah, so typically it's either kind of simple methods like the RT estimation method that I presented in this talk where you can sort of analytically derive a posterior or it's MCMC or ABC. They're typically the routes that we go down. I uh, say, so thank you. I have a quick question about the serial interval. So how does that, um, how sensitive is the reproduction rate estimate to the serial interval? So how important is it that you get that right? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. So typically, um, if what you're interested in is the question of whether the reproduction number is bigger than one or not, then the answer to that question is not especially sensitive to the to the serial interval. If you're interested in the exact magnitude of the reproduction number, though, then the serial interval is something that's very important. Um, as so I mentioned, so in this example here, you've got a generation time, but also a serial interval that changes in time. Accounting for that is likely to be very important if you want to know exactly what the reproduction number is. If you want to know simply is the reproduction number bigger than one or not, then getting your serial interval exactly right is, is um, less important. I would say, though, that knowing the exact magnitude of the reproduction number is something that you might care about, though, because if the reproduction number is two, then what that means is that in order to bring the outbreak under control, you need to stop half of transmissions to bring the reproduction number down to one. Um, and so I think that sort of demonstrates that the exact magnitude of the reproduction number is important, and therefore knowing what your serial interval is as accurately as possible is also important. Hello, I'm Eric Wibbona. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, in the UK, is it, because I tried to estimate these uh, quantities from public data in Italy, but in Italy, they, it's, not, it's, not, it's not possible to know about uh, the um, serial intervals, because people report data, but you don't have access to them, because only, only the ESS, the, the Health uh, uh, National Institute for Health, uh, has access to this data, and they are not given to the public. Is it public in UK? Yeah, that, that, uh, that's a really good question. So. Um, this work that's on the screen at the moment, so the UK data, this came from a study in UK households. Um, that was not public data. So that was as a result of a collaboration with the UK Health Security Agency. Um, we report, so with the paper that we, papers that we wrote on this, we reported kind of summary values of, of, um, of that data. But um, uh, so I think the honest answer is often it's not. Um, yeah, I guess as you're alluding to, that's that's a shame because it makes it very hard to get lots of people doing estimates of reproduction numbers. And really, that's what you need if you want kind of good evidence. You don't just want one group using one set of assumptions to estimate the reproduction number. You want multiple groups to be doing that. Um, so I think going forward, that's certainly something that needs to be discussed more, the kind of importance of making these types of things public. But in, in this example, it wasn't. I mean, typically, serial intervals can be estimated either from sort of household studies where you can make assumptions about who infects who or contact tracing studies. And so, you know, making those types of data public is clearly really important and not just waiting for someone to publish something, you know, a year after the fact. Okay, thank you. If we don't have any further questions, let's thank Robin again.